Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer had a very shiny nose. And if you ever saw it, you would even think it glows. Something the other reindeer were all cons to Rudolph. And they wouldn't let poor Rudolph play any of the reindeer games. Then one shiny Christmas Eve, Santa came to say, Rudolph, with your nose so bright, won't you drive my sleigh tonight? And that's not a euphemism for sexual harassment by a creepy mall Santa. Hey, everybody. How's it going? So today, we're going to be working on a MacBook that's not turning on. Let's dig into it and try and figure out why this MacBook isn't working. I'm going to plug in the multimeter, turn on the power supply, connect it to the computer, and see if we can figure out why this isn't working. Got ourselves a good old-fashioned MacBook repair. It's been a while, hasn't it? So it looks like what we have over here is an 8200426 board, and someone has done the absolutely evil, disgusting tactic of taking the board out of the case without keeping the DC in board screwed into the computer. I don't understand the point of that. I don't understand how you do any troubleshooting on this board without being able to plug a charger into it. So whoever's doing this type of evil crap and taking the board out of the case, but then not plugging the DC and board into it, I just want you to know, from my heart to your ears, you are evil. So let's get started on this MacBook board repair now, shall we? So I'm going to plug it in, and we are going to see how many amps it takes and see if we can fix this MacBook. I'm excited. Got to make a couple of adjustments to my streaming setup here. I am an evil capitalist after all. So we got monetization on so that I can make money off of all of you. That's right. Yes, we're going to buy Clinton more greenies. Buy more of these uh, weird-looking fleece shirts for the wintertime. And pay back the $61,000 in back rent debt to my current landlord. So what's going on here? We have a MacBook that's taking 85 milliamps, not turning on. When we go to the overhead camera, what you'll see is that we have no light in the charger. Now, what's the first thing we need in order to get a green light in the charger on a classic MacBook, like an 820-00426, we have a one-wire circuit? What do you need to get a light in the charge? Does anybody in the chat know? Anybody able to answer that question? PP Bush G3 Hot. Okay, I'm literally the... If I, I gotta log into Twitch and demod you. I can see that you're a mod, and you think PP Bush G3 Hot is necessary before PP3 V4 too. How dare you? Shame. Shame. Shame! It's pp3v42 underscore g3 hot. Who made you a mod when you don't even know the order of the power rails? I'm okay. I'm going to open up a schematic and show you how wrong that is. I'm going to show you how wrong that is, sir. Make sure to demean our audience while we do it. I hear the key to success on these platforms is to, to, to demean your, not your audience, but particularly your moderators at every, uh, at every point that you can. We're going we're gonna to be trying a, a different style here today at Roth. Ross and Repair Group. Let's go over to the charger. So the charge port is going to be this thing right over here. See that? That is the charge port. No, I don't mainly read YouTube chat. I read shit Twitch chat so that I could shoot my mods. I read Twitch chat. What do you think I'm screaming at right now on completely unfairly like a dick? My Twitch mods. That's right. I read your Twitch chat just enough to berate you. So J7000. This here is going to be my charge port. So let's take a look at the charge port, shall we? Let's check out the charge port. So what do we have here at our charge port? We have 18 volts, or 20 volts in this case, depends on the schematic you're looking at. 20 volts, that's going to be the power from the charger. You have ground to complete the circuit, ground. And then you have adapter sense. Now adapter sense is going to be what's important. Adapter sense is going to be what really what, what we're really focused on here with regards to why we don't have a green light. Now, what is U7000 here for? Adapter Sense is going to be something that speaks to the system management controller. Because if you click on Sys1 wire, you'll see that Sys1 wire really is something that's going to go to the SMC. Let's just click on Sys1 wire over there. Twitch also here, and I'm sorry, you can't make money from Twitch ads, LOL. Thank you. Yeah, Twitch has some sort of exclusivity agreement where you can't uh, multi-stream to YouTube at the same time, or else you, you, they don't pay you. And... Uh, I, I'm, I'm loyal. YouTube is evil, but at least they pay. Me. At least they tell me what they're going to pay me. So here you have uh, Adapter Sense. Adapter Sense is going to go over, and that's going to become uh, Sys One Wire. And Sys One Wire is going to be something that goes over to the System Management Controller. 
That's what this is. Sys one wire. Sys. Oh. M. Sys underscore one wire. Right over here. So that is going to our system management controller, the SMC U5000. So the SMC is going to want to talk to the charger before it gives you a green light in the charger. Now, what is U7000 doing? U7000 is kind of like the bouncer. So this adapter sense line is about a 3-volt line, right? About a 3-volt line. Now, over here, you have a 20-volt line. So what do you think is going to happen if some drunk jackass is trying to plug in his MacBook and he's, like, doing something like this? Like, look, look, I want to use my MacBook. What? What may happen is that 20 volts may go over to the adapter sense line, which is the 3-volt data line, and then it will send 20 volts over to the SMC. Now, keep in mind, this computer was made before 2016. This was made before Apple had an obsession with putting a 52-volt power line next to a 1.7-volt data line. An engineer actually used their brain when they devised the one-wire circuit, and they thought, hmm... Having 20 volts next to 3 volt data line, yeah, that could end poorly. Maybe we should do something about that. So what they did back then, again, before the touch bar machine, where the, all bets are off and 52 volts can be next to 1 volt all, all, all day long, is they put this chip here. So what this does, it says, okay, if what's going on outside externally, you have external, internal, if what's going on outside is 3 volts, I'll let it go through to the SMC. If, you're if what's going on outside is 20 volts, nah, 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 you don't get to go through the SMC. That's what U7000 is going to do. Now, U7000 is powered over here at its VCC pin by SMC BCACOK underscore VCC. Now, that power is coming from this little logic gate over here. This logic gate is going to turn on if SMC BCACOK is present, and SMC BCACOK is going to be present. If it's present, it's going to pass through PP3V4 to underscore G3Hot over here. That's why you need PP3V4 to underscore G3Hot to get the green light. You need PP3V4 to underscore G3Hot to get the green light because A, the one-wire circuit is powered off of PP3 before 2. And B, the system management controller, the chip that Adapter Sense is actually going to be speaking to, is also powered off of PP3 before 2. So if we were to go over to the next logical place in the schematic, over here to the SMC, let's just revisit our SMC. The SMC, U5000, is powered by PP3V42. So the one-wire circuit, which was required for communication with the SMC, and the SMC itself are both powered by PP3V42 underscore G3Hot. PP3V42 underscore G3Hot on any MacBook Pro from 2008 to 2015, or dare I, with the Airs up to 2017, is the first rail that's necessary for it to turn on, and not PP Bush G3Hot. Now, why do people always think it's PP Bush G3Hot that's the first rail? That's an excellent question. A, besides the fact that our Twitch mods are engaged in a disinformation campaign for which we will punish them, we also have the fact that the schematic itself, admittedly, is written like complete dog shit. So if we were to scroll to the page where they describe all the power rails in the machine, you'll notice that they don't list the power rails in the order that they actually need to turn on, which is something that would make sense. And again, you know, God forbid whoever writes this thing actually write it in a manner that makes any fucking sense. So in the power aliases page, which is where they list all the power rails, you have PP3V4 PP3 to underscore G3Hot mentioned as number 10. It's number 10. What is this? PP Bush G3Hot is rail number one. PP3421 Scar G3Hot is rail number 10. That doesn't make any sense. Why would it be that the first rail necessary for the computer to work is listed in the schematic as rail number 10? Maybe because the people writing the technical documentation are just as high as the people engineering the device. I don't know. Just a guess. So... Let's get into this. Now, PP3 or 4 to underscore G3Hot is the first row that we need. Let's plug it in, and we're going to see if that's present on this MacBook. See if that's, what we, if that's what's missing, and if that's the cause of our machine not giving us a light. You never know. Again, I don't know if that's the cause of it, but it's just something that we should check out. Just something we should double check. All right. Now. I don't think that's the case, by the way. I don't think that's what's wrong. But I'll let you know how I know it soon. And hint, it has something to do with this number that you see over here. This is the amount of power that the board is drawing from our power supply. So I am going to right-click over here on Paul Daniels' amazing software. Right-click on PP3V42 underscore G3Hot. 
and we are going to see what it is in this board. I'm going to click right over here. We got L7095 is a lovely place to measure, and I got no, no, no qualms against measuring for it right over there. What do we get? 3.4. Okay, so well, we have PP342 underscore G3 hot, so that's not necessarily going to be the cause of us not having the green light. Now let's go back to that one wire circuit that I was showing you before, right over here by U7001. Let's show that on the schematic in the board view. Let's see what's going on in this page. Well, what do we have over here? So we need this logic gate. Remember, this logic gate needs to have SMC BCACOK on the input in order to shoot out PP342 underscore G3 hot as SMC BCACOK VCC on output so that U7000 can be powered. And once U7000 is powered, adapter sense will be allowed to, to speak to the SMC. So do we have SMC BCACOK, which I incorrectly used to read as SMC BCACOK? Let's take a look. Pins 1 and 2 on U7001. All right, what do we have here? So I'm just going to flip the board over, check out over here. We got SMC BCAC okay? We have 0.1 volts. Okay, that's no good, right? We, we shouldn't have 0.1 volts there. Now, I cannot blame this chip for not working. I cannot blame the chip for not working because it's not getting its input signal that it needs to turn on. So what do we do from this point? Well, let's follow everything back. Where does SMC BC AC OK come from? That's an excellent question. And that's a question that I intend to figure out the answer to. So let's follow along over here. SMC BC AC OK. OK. So that is a signal that is, looks like it's pulled up by PP3V42 underscore G3 hot. And what does it go to? It goes to U7001, and it goes to U7100. U7100 could potentially be pulling this down. Well, let's take a look at U7100, shall we? Let's take a look at this chip in this area and see what that looks like. I'm going to put on the microscope over here. Put on this beautiful little microscope. See what we have in the microscope. What's sitting over here? What's... Okay, does anything look off to you over here? What do you all see? What do you all see? I see an ISL6259, honestly. I don't know really. That's all I see. Well, what is this chip responsible for? Well, let's take a look at the schematic again and get an idea. Now, this is responsible for taking the 18 volts of the 20 volts from your charger up here and turning it into 12.6 volts for your system down here. It's also responsible for regulating sending that 12.6 volts to your battery. So it's responsible for allowing your battery right here to power your computer, allowing your computer to charge your battery, and allowing the computer to create the rail that is going to work and power everything else in the machine, which is PPBush D3 hot, if your battery is not connected. A simple buck converter, as Tom Varik said. So let's take a look around here and get an idea of the number of different things that could be wrong. And by the way, does anybody else see bullseyes over here? Anybody see a bullseye? This is something that we're going to be putting on the visual inspection section of Repair.Wiki. And by the way, if you have repair skills for these types of devices, you are encouraged to contribute to the wiki at Repair.Wiki. And if you think you have expert level advice to give on devices that are highly in demand for repair, I would genuinely appreciate you taking the time, and I would also be open to offering you compensation from Repair Preservation Group for the time that you put in to such content. What do you see over here? What do you see that's going to be really, really important and determining what's wrong with this before I even use my multimeter. Yes, Tom Varek pays attention. Tom Varek, Varek, Vareki. I apologize for butchering your name. I don't know how to pronounce people's names if they have more than one syllable and more than three letters. But this is a good point. What he's pointing to are the bullseye that we have right up here. Take a look. I'm going to turn on the multimeter. And this it looks like a bullseye. And that resistor is measuring open line and open line. Now, what are those two resistors supposed to be measuring? 
Let's take a look at the schematic and see what they're supposed to be measuring. Those two resistors, according to the schematic and board view, when I click on those two resistors that look like they have a bullseye on them, R7122 and R7121 are supposed to be 10 ohms. 10 ohms and 10 ohms. And what am I getting? Open line, infinite ohms. Now, that resistor, are the, these are the current sense resistors. Well, what does a current sense resistor do? That's an excellent question. Let's go through this with the schematic full screen rather than the board view. Now, this is where 18 volts is gonna, or 20 volts is going to come from your charger. It's gonna, this, uh, this chip can turn on this transistor to allow it to go through. Now, you have 18 volts over here. Now, what this thing is going to do over here, it's going to take that 18 volts and it's going to turn it into pulses of 12. And if you'll give me a moment, I can actually show you what that looks like on screen. And if you're kind of confused as to how these circuits work, you can check out the training guide that is linked to below. There's a beginner's guide link below. So this is how a buck converter works. So you got, let's say, 8 volts up here. It takes the 8 volts and it just t switches it on and off and on and off and on and off because that's how a transistor is working here. It's working like a switch that you could just turn on and off. It turns on and off really quick. So you got eight, a lot of zero. A little bit of eight, a lot of zero. A little bit of eight and a lot of zero. And what happens when that goes through an inductor and has to deal with capacitors to ground on the other side to smooth it out? You get a nice smooth 1.7 volts. It's not, it, it smooths it out. It's not perfect. It's not a pretty exactly straight line, but this is what it looks like each step of the way. You have eight volts, you take it and you make pulses of eight volts, and then you wind up with something like 0.8 or 1 volt or something near there. And the same thing is happening on this schematic. You have 18 volts up here. It's going to be turned into pulses of 18. And then once it goes through the inductor and has the smoothing capacitor to ground, it turns into an even, easy, breezy, beautiful 12.6 volts. So what is a current sense resistor? Well, what this does over here is it's going to allow this chip to know how much amperage is being used. It knows that this is 20 volts, but it doesn't know how much of the 20 volts is going through. So if you look at a river or you look at a stream, you know there's water there and you have an idea of how much water is there, but how fast is the water moving through the stream? The only way you can tell how fast the water is moving through the stream or how strongly it's moving through the stream is to put your hand in it and feel how hard it's hitting up against your hand. If you're too far away to do that, you may want to have your friend put your hand in there for you. Now, in the case of this machine, U7100 is controlling everything. This is the chip that's responsible for controlling when these transistors open. It's responsible for controlling when the charger opens. And it does not have its hand in the stream. So what it does is it says, Hey, R7120, can you do me a favor and put your hand in the stream right before the charger gets to the rest of the system? And R7120 says, Sure, man, I'm happy to be over there and put my hand in the stream. And it does. Now, the way that you're going to tell how much amperage it's taking is the voltage drop across this resistor. If you have 18 volts over here and 17.9999999 over here, then U7100 can see, okay, there's not much of a difference between this and this. You're not using much amperage. If U7100 sees that you have 18 volts over here and one volt over here, it's going to say, oh my God, you must be taking 10,000 billion amps. Turn off the charger, halt the systems. We're not doing anything at all. And rather than having this go straight to U7100, there's a resistor in between. So, and again, you know, God forbid U7100 shorts the ground or something like that. You don't wind up blowing up or exploding your charger. You want to avoid having that. So they have a 10 ohm resistor between this and this. Now, if one of these resistors is blown, or both of them is blown, then U7100 is going to have no idea what the voltage is at R7120. And if it can't tell what's going on, or if you're driving your car and somebody tosses a sweater on your face and you can't see, what's the first thing you're going to do? You don't know what's going on. You're going to smash in the brakes because you don't want to drive when you can't see, the same way that that buck converter is not going to want to supply power to the machine if it has no idea how much amperage is being used. Now, the question that we now have is how did those two resistors blow? And that's a good question. So what could cause this resistor to blow? What causes a resistor to blow is typically A, corrosion, so having a bunch of green corrosion on the board, which obviously is not the case here. I don't see any liquid damage here at all. B, too much power being passed through it. Now, what you could see here is that this is made to take one sixteenth of a watt. You put two or four eight sixteenths of a watt through it, and it may blow up. It doesn't like having more than one sixteenth of a watt put through it. What would cause more than one sixteenth of a watt to go through it? Well, let's say if you have 18 volts from the charger on this end, 
let's say if you have this 18 volts from the charger over here, and the other end, I don't know, went to ground. Well, that, that very well possibly could have happened. How could that happen? What could cause both of these resistors to go to ground? Well, there's two possibilities. Behind door number one, both of these capacitors that go to ground over here, both C7121 and C7122, which both have a path to ground down here, let's say both of these capacitors decided to die at the exact same time, blowing R7121 and R7122. Because if these caps blow, the way that a capacitor failing typically tends to happen is it winds up just turning into a wire. When resistors fail, they go open line, meaning that they don't pass anything at all. Whereas when capacitors fail, capacitors tend to fail more like uh, just becoming a wire. So I'll give you an example of that. This, by the way, also comes from my guide, which is freely available to anybody who wants to check it out and will be is in the description of this video. Resistors typically wind up failing by not passing anything. They kind of get erased internally, and this is obviously, you know, shit Microsoft Paint, but you get the idea. It winds up going from being a 10-ohm resistor to infinitely resisting and not passing anything. The way a capacitor usually fails is by the exact opposite. So you have a capacitor. A capacitor is typically only passing AC. It will not pass DC. However, when a capacitor fails, it will wind up, uh, the plates may, uh, again, this is really shitty Microsoft Paint over here, but it, instead of blocking DC, it will go straight through. And again, this is obviously a really crude representation in Microsoft Paint to get the point across if you're not an electronics expert. And this is how it will fail. So now we have two different possibilities here. And typically, the simplest one is always the one... Here, let's see, uh, replace that. The simplest one is typically the one that is correct. So we have R7121 and R7122 that are blown. They're both blown. So either A, two discrete, distinct capacitors both failed at the exact same time. Or... This, the thing that both of these chips had in common failed at the same time, which is U7100. So R7121 and R7122 both have U7100 in common. They do not have the capacitors in common. C7122 and C7121 are separate capacitors. So either A, two discrete things both happen to fail at the exact same time, or B, one thing that both of these chips that are bad have in common failed at the exact same time. I would tend to assume that the most simplistic definition is the one that, that is the one that, that is uh, the, the likely possibility. I would assume that U7100 shorted to ground. U7100 shorted to ground and then shorted to ground R7121 and R7122 at the same time. The likelihood of this chip failing is more likely than that this capacitor and this totally separate capacitor decided to fail at the exact same time. So the first thing I want to do, just to figure out if my theory is even remotely close to correct, is try and measure and see if there is an actual short to ground at any of these points. So I want to see, do I have an, do, am I measuring a short to ground? So I have 18.85 kilo ohms here and uh, 2.3 ohms here. which uh, at this point actually kind of uh, destroys my theory. My theory was that U7100 was probably shorted to ground rather than the cap. However, since one of them is shorted and not the other, it, it's still possible that U7100 could be the cause of my problem, but it's also possible that it is something else all, that, that, that I was wrong. So let's see. Again, I'm, I'm just making educated guesses here. So R7121, this is shorted to ground, this isn't. So that could mean that C7121 is shorted. Now, it could also mean that pin 28 of U7100 is shorted to ground, whereas pin 27 of U7100 is not shorted to ground. Both of these are possibilities. And the only way we're going to figure out which one is the case is by removing one or the other or by injecting power. Admittedly, injecting power is kind of a waste here because I have, I have pointed out that my short is going to be in this area. I don't believe that, uh, that it's worth it to inject, do all the work of injecting power when the short is literally going to be one of two things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the capacitor because it's easier for me to remove that capacitor than it is for me to remove the chip to see if that is the cause of my problem. And no, the capacitor does not have a hole in it. If you take a look, you'll see that the resistors on the top have holes in them. This has a hole. And this has a hole. The capacitor looks beautiful. 
And admittedly, the ISL 6259 also looks beautiful, even if its solder joins are typical trash Apple fare. So let's get started. What do you think the problem is going to be? Do you think it's going to be the ISL 6259? Do you think it'll be the cap? Or do you think it'll be both? Place your bets. Whoever's wrong will be banned from the chat. Place your bets. The only... Winners get a chicken dinner. Losers pay my back rents for my store lease. Okay, so the capacitor has been removed and we're just gonna put that down for a moment and we're gonna see if we still measure a short. It's the ISL 6259, it's not the cap. We still have a two ohm short over there even after removing the capacitor. So whoever said it was the capacitor and not the ISL 6259, uh, I will send you directions on how to go and pay my store's back rent debt, and you will, Sunny Days, the moderator, will also be removing you from the chat uh, permanently. You'll all be banned for getting the answer wrong. There's, it's really no fun if there's no consequences, you know what I mean? We've removed the ISL 6259. Now let's take a measurement. Let's see if our short is gone. I mean, obviously it's gonna be gone because nothing is there. There you go, 92,000 ohms. So our short the entire time was the ISL 6259, not the capacitor. So now we're going to replace that other resistor because that resistor is no good as well. So my initial guess was correct. My guess was that it was an ISL 6259 failure and not the capacitor. And the reasoning for that is because the likelihood of both failing at the same time for the capacitors is very low, whereas the likelihood of one chip failing at the same time is more likely. When it comes to cat, what's more likely, a simple failure or a dual failure of different of separate components, I'm always going to go for the simplest explanation. The simplest explanation is not always going to be the correct one, but it is more often than not going to be the correct one, and it also saves you time when diagnosing. It saves you time when troubleshooting. The simplest explanation tends to be the one that is the correct one, the one... Why did the ISL 6259 fail? I don't know. Ask Apple. I don't know. I'm not an engineer. I'm a bum. Ask somebody that's an actual engineer. I just clean up in aisle five. I couldn't even pass freshman chemistry in college, and I had to cheat on my chemistry to get out of high school. You need somebody with a brain to answer that question. But it died, and we're going to replace it. And once we replace it, it'll work again until the customer blows it again. Remove those two resistors. By the way, store.rossmangroup.com does have fresh ISL 6259s in stock. Okay, we remove those resistors. Don't ban me. I recommend you to repair shop to someone with a MacBook Air that's having video card issues. Well, I'd have no reason to ban you unless you're one of the people that thought it was the cap instead of the ISL, in which case you've committed a crime that you will never recover from here. I'm not replacing the MOSFET as well, and the reason I'm not replacing the MOSFET is because we didn't have an issue 
with anything around the transistor shorting to ground. We had an issue with currents and shorting to ground. Now, if we had an issue where there was a short to ground on PP bus G3 hot, and that short to ground was either the ISL6259 or one of its two MOSFETs, then by all means we would be replacing that as well because I don't want one to kill the other. But we're far enough away from that 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 doesn't really that that's not going to be an issue. This failure is further enough away from it that I'm not worried about that as an issue. Okay. But I appreciate that question that you asked because that means that you're paying attention and you're also thinking about how to not kill the customer's computer. And if you were asking that question about, let's say, a CPU V-Core buck converter, if that was a CPU V-Core buck converter and somebody did not think about that, and the short was not on a current send circuit, but rather on the actual output of the chip, or on then, or on let's say the chart uh, on the phase pin of the buck converter. Then you you are potentially risking sending eight or twelve volts into a customer CPU. So that thinking is good thinking. So extra credit to Daniel Oliveira for keeping in mind a five-year-old video I did on buck converter troubleshooting. That's that's impressive. You get extra credit, you get a gold star. This, this chip is soldered on more crooked than a charity started by Clinton or Trump. Oh my god. We'll fix that in a moment. No big deal. As long as it's down on the board, solder on the center pad. That's going to get soldered into place, you'll see, using magic. Magic. Wait, watch and wait, baby. I sure wait, you didn't see that. I don't think you actually saw that. That's probably a good thing that that wasn't in view, because if that was in view, you'd probably think less of me as a human being. You didn't see that. Watch as the magic of surface tension brings us all together. Can you imagine if American politics had the concept of surface tension? All you do is apply a mild amount of heat and everybody just comes together? Yeah, lol. Not in my lifetime, right? Okay. So, move the ISL over just a little bit. And then we'll be done here. There's still enough flux that I can just do this really, really quickly and not have to worry about having a cold joint or any sort of Hershey's Kiss looking thing over there. And okay, we'll wait for it to cool off a little bit and we see if it turns on. I'm pretty sure we're going to get a fan spin. I'm actually quite confident we're going to get a fan spin. What do you all think? Kind of hungry, so I'm probably going to get something to eat if the fan spins here. If the fan doesn't spin, I don't get to eat. If the fan does spin, then I have the privilege of getting myself some food. All right, let's see. What do we got? So we plug it in, and I got a light in the charger, and I have 1.6 amps, and I have a fan spin. Bada bing, bada boom. Look at that. All right, that's it for today, and as always, 
I hope you learned something. If you want to learn how to do this stuff, there are links down below that are, go over pretty much all of this. You have a beginner's guide, which is completely free. It's about 150 pages. It goes over a lot of basic electronics. It also goes over the theory of how this current sound circuit works and everything that's required for the one-wire circuit, everything that's required for the ISL6259 to turn on, the sequence of how the ISL6259 turns on and how you get SMC, BC, AC, OK out of it, how to get a green light in the charger, what a buck converter does, what a DC to DC boost circuit does. It has access to a forum where there are tens of thousands of entries from people saying, how do I fix this? This is how I fixed it, which you can search through for free. And there is also a repair wiki that goes over all the different problems and how to fix them. What the typical cause is when something is not working. If this is your symptom, this may be your problem. We're also going to be doing repair workshops into the future where people can come by and they can ask questions a few times a week. I'm going to be announcing those on this channel and also in a meetup group. And we also do have paid classes for people who want to send their employees or who are, who are adding board repair to their business if they, want one, if they want tutoring over the course of a week in a classroom kind of environment. And above all, we have store.rossmangroup.com where we show all different types of things like this Atten Hot Air Rework Station. So the Atten Hot Air Rework Station that we use at all the different stations here. This is a beautiful hot air station, powerful enough to solder QFNs in a MacBook. It's, it comes with bent nozzles to make your life easy in a microscope for the low, low price of $2.29 in free shipping. You can't beat that, folks. $2.29 in free shipping. And if you buy it today, I'll throw in something special that hasn't existed for the past month. The website will actually work so that when you go to check out, you'll be able to buy it, which apparently it hasn't for the past month. And I just noticed it now. That's it for today. As always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now.